So now your research that you did was double-blinded. Patients were given a placebo or non-placebo. Uh, there, there haven't been any other real studies uh, relating to like that. How I think it's the first one. How, how My feeling is it's really the first one to do in the proper way. And uh, I can I'm going to show you. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, so I mean, the ivermectin story, it's really become a project and we have few other items that I'm not going to discuss it uh, this uh, evening. So our study was ivermectin versus placebo. And again, we looked at the mild cases, non-hospitalized patient, and it was double blind randomized control uh, trial. And later on, I will tell more about the uh, looking into this type of patient because people may ask well, why we have to bother ourselves with uh, patients who are already uh, diagnosed as a mild, having mild disease. So just to go quickly, it got the IRB, the Helsinki approval by the Shiba um, Institute, by the uh, Minister of Health, and it's also registered in the NIH in the clinical trial gov, and you can see here uh, the number. Uh, the objectives of our study was reduction of viral shedding among mild to moderate COVID patients. So it's usually the beginning of the disease where they are not severe, not hospitalized, uh, <clears throat> good oxygenation, and to see whether in these uh, uh, people we can shorten the viral shedding. The other part was to evaluate the effect of ivermectin in preventing progression of this mild disease to a severe disease. I can tell you now that the sample size and I mean, all this was decided at the beginning of the outbreak. I'm talking about March of 2020. So many aspects we learned later on and also that only small fraction of the people are progressing into severe disease and therefore uh, we cannot answer the second question. So the study design was uh, to go to community and in Israel we have dedicated hotels that people who cannot be people diagnosed with corona and cannot stay at home, they are moving to hotels and we thought that because they are concentrated together, from the manpower point of view, it will be much easier to reach them in the hotel instead of running one by one to different houses along around Israel. And uh, we take uh, we took all adult people above 18 years old and pregnant women were excluded. Now, because we were looking for viral shedding, people with asymptomatic disease also were included because we were followed them, as you will see, by nasal swab to see whether the virus disappeared or not. So the intervention was either giving uh, ivermectin, and we have to remember that ivermectin is given according to body weight, or to give them a placebo. We decided to go more or less to the usual dose. A dose per day is usually 0.2 meg per kg. And usually for parasitic disease, we give it for one day. We decided here to increase the dose and to give it for three days. And uh, therefore we dis uh, <coughs> split the group to people up less than 70 kilo and people more than 70 kilo and they got 12 milligram to 15 milligram again for three days. It was double blind and the placebo was uh, done in the same, it, it looked the same as the uh, ivermectin. So it was really completely uh, blinded for all sides. Now the follow-up was to go and to do every two days to do nasal swab and actually to follow and to see who is going to be negative uh, earlier, the placebo or ivermectin, or maybe there is no any difference. The <coughs> primary endpoint was to see what's going on at day six from uh, the intervention. The sample size that we found was about 50 patients per each arm, so it's altogether about 100 patients, and this we were looking for 25 degrees in the timing of uh, between the two, the two groups until coming negative. Actually, what's happened that uh, final recruitment was even more, 116, but because we have quite high of dropout, you see 22 
had to be uh, dropped out uh, because usually because they came to the hotel at the end of the disease, so we're almost negative or negative, and we could not uh, look after them. And uh, therefore, at the final numbers, we got ivermectin 49 and placebo uh, 45. Uh, 45. So just to show you, when we uh, looked at the patient characteristic, we see that this, the, there's a small difference in the numbers we mentioned between ivermectin group and placebo, but all other parameters, the age, the, the number of risk factors, gender, weight, and weight is important because again, this drug is given by uh, weight. The percentage of asymptomatic uh, uh, people, patients, or the recruitment, altogether the rec recruitment CT level. CT level means, I'm not sure again how many people are familiar with the term here, but it means the number of cycles that you have to do until you find the virus. And if, if you have high cycle, that means you have a very low viral load. So you, we see that, uh, you don't see it here, but uh, the number, the <clears throat> level of CT level at recruitment was quite similar in uh, the same uh, in both groups. Uh, we try to get them as soon as possible after the initial, <clears throat> initial symptom. However, especially at the beginning of the pandemic in Israel, it took time until patients decided to go and to be checked. It took time until they got the results. So finally, we managed to get them around the, the median time four days from initial of the from the beginning of the symptoms. Now let's go to the results. Uh, if you see, these are the mean uh, CT level every two days that we follow them. Just to remind you again that when you have high CT level, it, it's good. It's mean the patient is going to be negative quite soon. So you can see what I dropped here is, and this is the beginning symptom onset. We have about four days until they were enrolled. And then we started to see, they started almost the same point, And we see that with the ivermectin, they become high CT level, again, means low viral load much more quickly. And here, this is the placebo arm. But you see that around the 10 days from symptom onset, they are becoming quite equal. And that's make the also more complicated, the follow-up of all this type of trial. If you know, or if you familiar, in most countries of the world, the policy today is that after 10 days from symptom onset, you can be out of isolation. And why, what's the point? The point is that usually after 10 days, even without any treatment, you become negative or to say it more uh, <clears throat> precisely, you are non-infectious. So you see here, people are in a CT level above 30, which considered to be non-infectious. So just to show you that if you need to find advantage, it should be at the early stage of the disease. So if you go and see now, <clears throat> what's the percentage of people who become negative or non-infectious at day four, six, eight, and 10, you can see that in the ivermectin on day four, 57% become negative compared to only 31 in the placebo group. And because the numbers are smaller, the sample size here, the p-value is almost significant. However, from day six, which actually was the primary uh, outcome, we see that it's highly significant that more people in the ivermectin group become negative, much more than the placebo group. And it continues to day eight and to, uh, 10, and later on it will diminish, as we mentioned, because even the placebo without any treatment, uh, they become uh, healthy. So this one uh, way to show that ivermectin really has a, <clears throat> a, an impact on the viral shedding. In multivariable logistic regression model, uh, we can see that 
<clears throat> taking into account the, the gender, the age, weight, and whether patients have uh, had symptoms or not, we see that ivermectin, the odds ratio of ivermectin to get the patient negatively at day six, it's more than three times compared to placebo. So it's really highly significant that with the ivermectin, you can reduce the viral load and patient become much more quickly, become negative or less infection, non-infectious. And this is the Kaplan-Meier way, Kaplan-Meier analysis. And this was done in symptomatic patients that we know exactly when the disease started. So you see the difference, the blue line is the ivermectin, which become negative quickly compared to the red lines, which are the placebo. So all this showed us that there was a really positive impact to the ivermectin. Uh, so all these aspects are related to viral shedding, which I mentioned to you at the beginning. Uh, this was the main uh, primary endpoint. Looking into the clinical deterioration of the patient, we uh, understood during the study that we are not having a, a sample, big sample enough to show it, but just to show you that among these people, we have about 10% who were more than 60 years old, and among and you see about 20% has another risk factor beside the age. And you can see that in the ivermectin, none of them deteriorating and required hospitalization, while two patients in the placebo group required hospitalization. So this is very small sample, but it means that we have to look further to this group and to see whether we are going to have another advantage of the ivermectin by <coughs> preventing the deterioration, preventing hospitalization, which we know that this is one of the main problems with the COVID pandemic, that hospitals are flooded with uh, severe patients. So other point is just about the safety issue. We, I mean, we are, I'm uh, <clears throat> running the tropical institute in our uh, hospital, or actually is the only one in Israel, and we used it a lot before the corona, and we know that it's a safe drug, but just to emphasize that also here, uh, that we have, we had no any safety issue with the patients. And again, the total dose that we use is slightly higher than was used in the daily anti-parasitic uh, infection uh, usage. So in conclusion, I can say that ivermectin, with our study, ivermectin demonstrated that it has anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity, which is highly important and people are not sure about it. We have to remember that in the literature, they are mentioning that ivermectin may have antiviral activity and may have also anti-inflammatory activity. Since we are talking about the beginning of the disease, the effect must be as an antiviral. Anti-inflammation relates to the second stage of the disease when people got that uh, <clears throat> cytokine uh, storm. So here we are more focusing about its antiviral activity and we actually showed that it reduced the viral shedding period, period and therefore it reduced the infectivity time of the patient. And this has a significant public health impact. And I told you at the beginning, people ask me, why do you interest in having mild patients with less, slightly less days of being infection? We have to remember that 90 to 95% of the COVID patients are here in this category. And the economic burden, the social burden, all related to the isolation and to uh, prevent them from being either at homes or being in uh, at work. And if this is really work, the, it means that instead of being isolated for 10 days or 14 days in other countries, maybe at the beginning, at diagnosis, they can have three days of treatment and afterwards they can be outside of the isolation. So it's a major change 
in the economic of the uh, of the this uh, pandemic. So we have to remember that from this aspect, this is highly important, especially for countries which are the most countries on the world in the world which still don't have the vaccine. Vaccine is not available. Only in Israel we really running with the vaccine, and actually still we don't see the reduction in number of patients. So uh, the uh, or let's say it even more, the thought that the vaccine going to solve the whole issue, it's kind of a dream. We, it's going to take a long time until mass majority of the population will be vaccinated. We know the children are not being to be vaccinated for many years. And we know that many, that many people still don't want the vaccine or it's not available. So the need for a drug which can really shorten the viral load, shorten the infectivity time, it's highly, highly needed. But if I ask myself, or if you ask what the other implication, if we know now that it really has an impact on the viral load, then we can use it for two other purposes. One is the prevent, the second one, prevent clinical deterioration, which I mentioned before. If people at the beginning, and especially we have to target, let's go and talk only about high risk people, those who are at age more than 50 or 60 with another risk factor, and to this relatively small fraction of the population, give this uh, treatment to avoid the clinical deterioration and the need for hospitalization and uh, ventilation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other way to use it, it's if it goes and it antiviral, so maybe we can use it as prophylaxis. It means if you have an index, index case at home, then immediately after diagnosis, give ivermectin to the whole household uh, person, uh, people, and then maybe you can prevent the infection of the rest, or you can do it for a uh, <clears throat> uh, healthcare worker who are expose themselves quite often. So all these type of things, are now, I would say, are possible. It should be done, or it should we should continue and do more studies relating to these aspects. We actually we thought about doing a study in Israel about clinical deterioration. However, with the vast majority of people over 60 being vaccinated, we thought that we are not going to get enough people for this uh, uh, for this study.